Hello and welcome to another video where we continue our discussion on chapter 43 and we're going to focus on skin cancer and burns in this video. Skin cancer is one of the most common cancers in the world and we're going to start out talking about non-melanoma skin cancers and that's going to include basal cell carcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma and then we will talk about malignant melanoma which is a very serious type of skin cancer and the most common cause of death from skin cancer. So let's go ahead and dive into basal cell carcinoma. It is going to be the most common cancer in the world and there's a lot of different subtypes. And some of those are pictured over here to the right such as a superficial carcinoma, nodular, we can also have it be pigmented like you see here and morpheiform, which is a recurrent tumor and we can also have a combination of these. So we can have very different clinical presentations depending on what type we have. It does grow slowly and it can have a depressed center as it continues to grow and a rolled border and small blood vessels on the surface giving the appearance of that telangiectasia that we've been talking about. As any of these lesions continue to grow, it can start to or invade surrounding tissues over months and years. Rarely is it going to metastasize because these lesions typically do not go into the blood or lymphatic vessels. Our next type is squamous cell carcinoma or SCC and this is a tumor of the epidermis. It is also the second most common human cancer and we start to see a lesion develop that is known as an actinic keratosis. Like we said it is usually confined just confined just to the epidermis but it can extend into the dermis and that brings us to our two different types. We have in situ or invasive. We know that the in situ is just going to stay within that epidermis over there and it can lead to things like lip cancer and this is mostly seen within older white men. There are some risk factors such as if the person is immunosuppressed, does pipe smoking, or has chronic alcoholism and as this develops we can see that it becomes thickened and has an ulcerated center with a raised border. Now if it is invasive then we start to leave the area of the epidermis and move into the dermis where we also have our blood and lymphatic vessels. And so invasive SCC can grow more rapidly than we see with the basal cell carcinoma and it could spread to the regional lymph nodes in this manner. And we could see an example of that over here on the ear. And this is a common area for it to take place because it is a sun exposed area. And as far as treatment, we could do surgical excision, radiotherapy, chemical destruction, immunotherapy, and adjuvant therapy. Next up is cutaneous melanoma, and this is a malignant tumor of the skin originating from the melanocytes. You are more at risk if you have a personal or family history of this, are having UV radiation exposure and are light skinned with repeated sunburns and of course there's other risk factors as well and we do see that this is increasing worldwide. And this melanoma is located in the basal layer of the skin because that's where our melanocytes are and results from them degenerating. And we do have a couple different types. We have this superficial spreading melanoma which is the most common. We also have this lentigo malignant melanoma and this is usually found in elderly people and you could see it kind of looks like an age spot so it's typically confused as that and then we've got our primary nodular melanoma which is an aggressive tumor and an acral lentiginous melanoma which is rare and aggressive and we typically find this this looks like almost like the sole of someone's foot and also the palms of the hand and we also tend to find this kind in the mucous membranes of Africa American people. The development of melanomas are typically associated with tumor suppressor genes and proto-oncogenes and the way that we can kind of keep an eye on certain markings on our skin is by using this ABCDE rule. And so A stands for asymmetry, B is for any type of border irregularity, C is for color variation, 
D is for having a diameter larger than six millimeters, which is the top of an eraser of a pencil, for example. And then E is for elevation, where we see it's a bit raised or evolving, meaning that there is some type of change taking place. Staging of melanoma is going to be done using the TNM staging rule, which we talked about in previous lectures. And to treat this, there can be a wide surgical excision, but if that lesion is greater than one millimeter deep, then we do have to do a lymph node biopsy of a sentinel node, which is the lymph node that is closest to the area draining it. Next, we have Kaposi sarcoma, and this is going to be a vascular malignancy associated with immunodeficiency. So that could be with transplant recipient patients or those that are taking immuno suppressive drugs for some other reason, or it could be someone who has an immunosuppressive disease or disorder such as HIV. And we do have different forms. There is the classic form that is more benign, uh, epidemic form that is rapidly progressive and associated with AIDS, and then the African endemic type that is associated with HPV, and an iatrogenic form that's associated with immunosuppressive treatment, such as getting an organ transplant. So the lesions that develop can be pruritic and painful, and the color can vary from red, purple, or brown macule type of lesions, and then can develop into plaques and nodules. And our last type is primary cutaneous lymphomas. This is a cutaneous T cell and B cell lymphoma that we find present in the skin without an evidence of a extra cutaneous disease at the time of diagnosis. This is rare. It's the second most common site of extranodal non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And it develops from a clonal expansion of the B cells the helper T cells, and rarely the suppressor cells. We do find that the most common type is going to be the cutaneous T cell lymphoma, and mycosis fungioides is the most prominent subtype. This tends to present with either a focal or widespread erythematose patches or plaques. There may be incidences as well in which we see some patches of alopecia. Now let's switch over to talk about burns. And burns can come from thermal or non-thermal sources, and they could be chemical, electrical, or radioactive sources. So in order to help identify a type of burn injury, we need to look at the level of tissue destruction, and that is going to give us a better perspective as how to clinically manage it, help the patient heal, and their mortality. So we are going to go into these different categories of first degree, second degree, third degree, and even fourth degree burns. And we'll start off with the first here. This is going to involve our epidermis only, and it is going to be pain within just that localized area and erythema. And this will typically take about three to five days in order to heal. With our second degree burn, we start seeing a partial thickness injury. So with our superficial partial thickness injury, which we see pictured over here, the epidermis and some of the dermis is destroyed and it could take up to almost a month for this to heal. With our deep partial thickness, which you see pictured over here, the epidermis and dermis is destroyed and it's leaving only skin appendages. So we tend to see a waxy or white look to the skin and it could take weeks to heal. And in order to treat this, sometimes the necrotic tissue is surgically removed and then they take some skin in an area that is unburned and they do an autograph to that area. Then for our third degree burns, we have a full thickness burn, which you could see pictured over here. This means that the epidermis, dermis, and the underlying subcutaneous tissue has been destroyed. And so we have a loss of dermal elasticity, which gives that dry leathery appearance to it. Some things to be concerned about is that the distal circulation may be compromised because we've got so much pressure from edema. And also we have the threat 
of compartment syndrome where we get compression of the blood vessels, veins, muscles, and abdominal organs. And so to prevent that, a escarotomy is performed in order to allow the tissue to decompress. And people with this type of burn may feel no pain because all of the nerve endings have been destroyed. Now let's move on to our fourth degree burn, which is a full thickness and deeper tissue type of burn. I have it pictured over here. At this point, the epidermis, dermis, and underlying subcutaneous tissue, possibly tendons, muscles, and bone have been destroyed. So this degree is definitely going to require skin grafting and reconstructive surgery. Now as nurses, you can estimate the total body surface area that has been burned using the rule of nines. And this gives us an idea of the severity of the burn injury. So essentially looking at an adult, the entire head is going to be 9%, the thorax is 9%, abdomen is 9%, the entire upper limb is 9% um, on each side of course, and then we've got the anterior lower limb as 9% and the posterior lower limb as 9% as well. So that is your rule of nines. Or we can use a modified Lund and Browder chart in which you have a similar looking body outline and you go through and mark the areas of the burn and you calculate the area using an age table that they have represented in the chart and you don't include any superficial burns. If someone has greater than 20% total body surface area that is burned, then that is considered a major burn injury, and it's associated with massive evaporative water losses and fluctuations of large amounts of fluid, electrolytes, and plasma proteins into the body's tissues. And this can develop into a profound life-threatening hypovolemic shock, and this is referenced to as burn shock, shock when we have a hypovolemic cardiovascular component and a cellular component. And here is a chart that kind of walks you through that process. So the direct tissue injury increases the capillary permeability, which allows the fluid to leak out, leading to edema, and we can get a systemic injury response, which will also increase the capillary permeability, furthering the edema. And with all of this fluid loss, we are then going to develop hypovolemia and hyperviscosity within the blood. And because we have a low amount of blood volume, we see that we have decreased cardiac contractility and decreased blood volume contributing to a depressed cardiac function. And blood is shunted away from the liver and the kidneys and the gut. And this is known as the ebb phase, EBB phase of a burn response. And so we are going to start to see multi-organ dysfunction taking place. We also have things like decreased oxygen consumption that are affecting multiple organs and a decreased perfusion of the viscera. So it's important to give a patient lactated ringer solution in order to restore circulating blood volumes. And you have to do this carefully as far as how many fluids you give, how quickly, and there are formulas in order to guide one in doing so. Now we've talked about some of the cardiovascular and systemic responses already, but with the hallmark of burn shock is decreased cardiac contractility and decreased cardiac output with inadequate capillary perfusion. And this is because we have that fluid and protein moving out of the vascular compartment, which you can see pictured over here. And as a result, we get that elevated hematocrit and white blood cell count and a hypoproteinemia. And if this is not immediately treated, then we have a profound hypovolemic shock and inadequate perfusion that can lead to irreversible shock and death within just a few hours. Now, if it's untreated or the person has extensive burns, then we continue to have burn shock, and at the end, we describe their condition as capillary seal. And another thing to consider is that the liver is vital in treatment of the burn, and that's because it really helps with the metabolic processes and making sure they are working correctly in order to get the body back into recovery. Now, if a patient has a greater than 30% total body surface area burn, then we are going to initiate a hypermetabolic response with an increase in the metabolic rate and a hyperdynamic circulation. And this starts about 48 hours after that ebb phase that we discussed. So we're going to call this the flow phase. 
And this is when we are going to see again that systemic hypermetabolic response. And this can last a year or longer following a burn. And so some of the things that are going to take place is we see increased levels of certain hormones or certain cells. Examples would be the levels of the catecholamines because the sympathetic nervous system is responding. Also increases within cortisol, glucagon, and insulin. We'll also see that we get an inflammatory response with local activation and recruitment of inflammatory cells such as the leukocytes and monocytes at the site of the injury and the cells release inflammatory cytokines that then are going to contribute to that hypermetabolic state. And this hypermetabolism increases the thermal regulatory set point and core and skin temperatures. So we are going to want to increase the ambient temperature and have early excision and grafting to decrease the amount of resting energy expenditure that person has, essentially reducing the demands on their body in order to improve mortality and prevent inflammatory mediators that are circulating to the lung and we can prevent things like pulmonary edema that can be life-threatening. The immunological response to this is going to be immediate, prolonged, and severe. And the end result is that the individual that survives burn shock is immunosuppressed, and they have an increased susceptibility to potentially fatal systemic burn wound sepsis. And this is due to having altered white blood cells that can, can't defend the body, increased inflammatory cytokines and antibodies, having impaired phagocytosis so they cannot eat up up any debris or pathogens that enter the body, abnormal cellular and humoral immunity, and potentially fatal wound sepsis. With any type of major burn injury, there is a loss of the skin's barrier function and ability to regulate evaporative water loss. Now, normally the skin is the major source of insensible water loss at 75%, and the lungs are a minor source at 25%. And this is, of course, going to increase dramatically with burns because we have this increased loss of water due to our skin being injured and going through hypermetabolism and hyperventilation within the lungs. So replacement is going to be mandatory to prevent volume deficit and shock. So burn recovery is going to be complex, prolonged, and there are many complications with major burns, especially if one has a inhalation injury as well. And the goal would be wound debridement and closure in a manner that is going to promote survival. We may have scar formation with contractors as the skin is healing in deep partial thickness and third degree burns. And the elements for survival of major burn is going to be provision of adequate fluids and nutrition, meticulous management of wounds with early surgical excision and grafting, which we see pictured over here, in which there are thin sheets of keratinocytes that are attached to gauze so that they can be applied onto this clean excised thigh and aggressive treatment of infection or sepsis, and lastly, promotion of thermoregulation.